All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Natasha Sattler, who is the author of Shit Adults Never Taught Us. Natasha, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I am doing great. Thanks so much for asking. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Oh, my gosh. Okay, a little bit about me. Whew. It's tough. I was like, born on the east coast and I tend to talk a lot so stop <laughs> me whenever you want to I got you. um I was raised in Maryland outside the DC area I've lived in Los Angeles for like 12 years now um I work my day job is in commercials I make tv commercials and music videos and I unintentionally became an author during the pandemic when things um slowed down a little bit and that book is called, like you said, Shit Adults Never Taught Us, which is a fun millennial based, Gen Z based, like self help guide to just all the stuff we didn't learn as kids growing up and the things that rapidly changed with technology and society and everything. Um, and for fun, I'm a travel junkie. I love it. I will go anywhere in the world if it is within reason and possible. Like, yeah. I mean, I I would go to the moon if that was possible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we might be taking trips to space within our lifetime, honestly. The second they let me bring a carry-on, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. Okay, so Travel Junkie, where is your favorite place that you've been? Oh, that is always the hardest question. Um, I have a few. My like top list that sort of it varies in my head just based on like the mood I'm in the way I'm remembering it um I love Vietnam I absolutely love Spain I find Greece really appealing and I want to explore more of it um I loved Israel I love um Denmark um I I could literally do this all day (laughs) and so do you try to hit a new location once a year twice a year how often are you traveling I don't have goals set like that necessarily because life happens, right? So like um, last year I bought a house and ended up renovating the whole house throughout the year. And so that just needed me to physically be present. But I did end up going to Portugal for two weeks during that time. Um, For the most part, I don't make a goal of like this year I'm going to go to three countries and I'm going to do it for this amount of days or this amount of weeks. It's just if something pops up and it's appealing to me, if friends invite me, if a trip deal shows up, if it's something that I'm just like inspired to go do, I do it and I don't think twice about it. I got you. Okay. There we go. And so you, in your day job, you're making TV commercials and music videos. Are you doing the writing for that? The producing? the video? I produce. Yeah. So I produce uh, post-production, which for most people doesn't uh, translate, but it's like the edit. It's basically from when the camera stops rolling to when it gets on air. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. What is the strangest part about the editing process for you? I think it's that nothing is the same twice like every single job is different and I find that like a lot of people go into work and they're like "Mm, I know what's gonna happen today I know what it's gonna look like and this industry is so different in that way because it's almost impossible to predict what your day is gonna be like you know what your skill set is you know what the general gist of it's gonna be but like it's different every single job yeah yeah and are they giving you like guides for how to edit and then you kind of take it or is it very specific step-by-step instructions? So we have editors that um, typically have a niche, like some are comedy-based, some are action, sports-based. And so the commercials that they are doing typically lend to their skill set. And so the director has some comments, the agency, the client, they all have their notes. But typically at the beginning, the editor runs with their vision and their style. And then the tweaks happen from there. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Well, Tell us about Shit Adults Never Taught Us. What are some of the things that you talk about in that book? All right, let's dive right in. Okay, so Shit Adults Never Taught Us is, I'm going to scare people with this, but I promise it's not scary, is a 98 chapter book. (laughs) It is 98 very brief chapters. They are two to three pages each. They are a snapshot of just the things you need to learn. It's broken into four sections. The first part is career and money. Then we... and career and money comes first because it's boring but like we probably already learned it at one point anyways we just didn't listen second part is relationship and that goes all the way from falling in love to breaking up and everything in between 
And then there's mind, which is all the things, mental health, depression, anxiety, et cetera. And then the last part is life. And it's all the things that we just like didn't learn. And the reason this book came about is I don't blame anybody for gaps in like our upbringing. The nineties to now was so radically different and rapidly changing the way our parents opened a bank account, did 401ks, changed jobs, uh, got health insurance, every aspect of it, investing, every aspect of it was totally different. The way that they dated was different. The way they approached mental health was different. The way they voted was different. The way they did literally every part of their life feels different. And so they taught us from what they know, our education system taught from a curriculum, and there are just got giant gaps in knowledge. We don't know that we can invest on an app with $20. We don't know what a high yield savings account is. We don't really know how to get health insurance or plan a 401k or an IRA. And like the way that social media has sort of stunted and morphed our view of the world, I find it's just crazy and we're like oh well everybody else seems to get it and we don't get it and you're like so afraid to ask questions you google something there's four different answers you're on page five now and you're overwhelmed and you just decide to give up so I did all the research for you and it's just there and if you read two to three pages you've got the info you need and every section is meant to be digested in 10 minutes meaning in 10 minutes you can do this thing like I just made a um, Instagram real highlight thing this weekend about freezing your credit and I was like, freeze your credit so that nobody can steal your social security number and open credit cards and bank accounts and things in your name. And it takes 10 minutes. And I just made the slides with the links. And I was like, here you go. Here's how you're going to do it. And in 10 minutes, this will no longer be an issue in your life. And that's the way that the book is designed is it's just like, you have this problem, pick it up, put the book back down. It's not a book that you read cover to cover because there's no way you need all 98 chapters today. <laughs> like yeah. you you pick it up for the instances in your life where you just feel a little bit lost. I got you. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So why did you write the book? Like, I feel like that's a really strange book to just stumble upon. Yeah, I kind of had to. I didn't mean to write a book. I, I was definitely an accidental author, but I was... Um, there was a brief time during the pandemic that I was without work and I was having conversations with friends and we were stuck in these like bubbles and things during the pandemic where I was like, okay, I need to like have these conversations in a really meaningful and just authentic way. And it felt like I was constantly talking to friends about anxiety and depression. And we were just all spinning our wheels. We were like, well, I feel really anxious. Well, I feel really anxious. Well, what do we do about it? I don't know. And like people were losing their jobs and they didn't have any savings. They didn't know what the, their retirement accounts were, how to access it. They didn't know how to make friends. They didn't know how to navigate relationships that were thrown into new circumstances. There was just so much during that time that like, it felt like our lives were in a magnifying glass. And we had so much that we didn't know how to answer. And so I wrote it because I was like, if I'm overwhelmed, other people are overwhelmed. The thing that really brought me to the book was just like this idea that I'm not special. There's nothing that I've gone through or the life lessons that I've learned that are exclusive to me. They have to be more universal. They have to be things that everybody or nearly everybody deals with. And so I was like, I'm going to figure this shit out and I'm going to talk about it. And that way other people don't have to do it the crunchy hard way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you just saw a problem. You were like, I need to, I need this help. I'm sure other people need this help. So let me document it while I get it to myself. Yeah. That's kind of my personality. I see a problem and I like feel the strong desire to fix it. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Yeah. Sounds like an entrepreneur to me. Do you have any yeah, entrepreneurial it tendencies? Yeah, like that. I mean, other than the book, I like writing and I like following passions like that. I've made journals and things and put them on Etsy, but I find that like, I just, I have such ADD that I just get sucked up into this idea in my head and I run with it until I get bored of it and I need to pivot to something else. And so I find entrepreneurs really need like that constant focus. And I don't know if necessarily that's where I'm at. I also get stressed really easily and I'm a naturally anxious person. I don't know if I've got that uh, calm level-headedness. I think you got it in you. It's so I, kind of you to say. <laughs> I think so. I think so because I think it's a, I think it's a skill. And that part that you just said, there's this book. I think oh. it's called Rocket Fuel. I think that's Oh, what okay. Yep. And it talks about how there are types of entrepreneurs, right? So there's the 
visionary type and then there's the integrator type and the visionary yeah. has this like big vision for life they really like to do stuff they really like to like jump from thing to thing to thing but they have big ideas and they want to lead the pack and like show people the way visionary. that sounds very similar to my personality honestly yeah this is what i'm saying yeah. and then there's the integrator and an integrator will not do well alone and a visionary will not do well alone but when the visionary oh. finds their integrator this is the person who gets in the weeds really focused on the systems Ooh. really focused on the details and they partner up and they're like visionary is like hey i see this opportunity i see this problem here's how we should solve it and the integrator is like okay well what does that look like from a key performance indicator perspective and a systems perspective and a hiring perspective and the integrator goes in makes all that happen while the visionary gets to you know kind of lead the pack inspire people help people and do what they like to do the most so it's so funny because the integrator sounds like my day job like that's basically what a producer does and then hobbies it sounds like I'm more the visionary and then I've got like these two sides of myself yeah. but they don't seem to like cross into each other in in certain fields and I I think it's interesting if people um, are defined as one or another. I find that I've always never been, you know how you take those tests where they're like, what's your personality type or what's this? I always feel like it's hard because I don't feel like I'm any one thing and I feel like I pivot too much. I get through these phases where I'm like all oh, very creative and then I get through phases where I'm not creative at all and I'm very like stuck in structure and I don't know. Yeah, it, I love the idea of being an entrepreneur. I just don't know if I've got the follow through. <laughs> I feel you. I'm not trying to sell you on anything here. I'm just saying, I think you'd make a great one. Um, because well, thank you. You already am naturally helping people and the whole, uh, you know, focus thing. And there are just ways to set up systems and partner with people who have the system so that you don't really have to focus as much and you can kind of be more free to do what you want to do. But the other thing yeah. I was going to say is that a lot of people have, um, have both, like actually everybody has both. And so, you're yeah. part visionary, part integrator, but it's like, which one is like naturally coming out in this moment and having the freedom to embrace that side of you, which it sounds like you already have. So no need to go into entrepreneurship, but you know, a lot of people don't. And so I just like to bring it up. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you never know. I didn't think I'd write a book and now all of a sudden here I am on the podcast year, talking about it. So next year you're going to have bought a business and then you're going to have to come back on the show and like, Timmy, you were right. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I'll hit you up the second that happens. Yep. <laughs> cool. Well, Natasha, tell us a little bit about your motivation. What really gets you up and keeps you going every day? I love the idea of changing and helping people. I find that like, this is the thing. And I know it's so, <laughs> it's such a big thing to say, right? But like, no, I was just going to say screams entrepreneur, but <laughs> go for it. <laughs> you're get, I'm going to own a business by the time this show's over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is like in the commercial world, you know, you make a lot of commercials that no people skip over on YouTube or they don't necessarily watch. Yep. Um, but it's if I make hundreds of these a year, it's only the ones that like really change the world that I'm going to remember. And I think of that in terms of a lot of things. When I look at like the things like travel, like we were talking about hobbies and, and literally living passionately, like when I go out and I see the world the things that I remember are the things that changed me. The yeah. things that like, I feel like on a cellular level, just change the way I think, change the way I move in the world. And if I can do that for somebody else, if I can change just a piece of their life for the better, that's what motivates me. That's the stuff that makes all of like the hard work and the stress and the late nights worth it. Mm. I love that. That's really cool. Thank you. Well, let's jump into your dreams and goals. Tell all us right, let's do it. Vision for your life, vision for the book. Okay, well, vision for the book I'm going to start with, actually, because it seems a little easier. So vision for the book is just, I want people to use it as their tool, their friend, their manual, their community, the questions that we're too afraid to ask. And I want it to keep finding a new audience because I think everybody that I talk to that's read it and like comes onto my Instagram and DMs me or people that send me emails and all of that, the way that I get to hear about how it's changed their life or helps them through something, I think is just so amazing. And I wanted to keep finding an audience and keep having that effect on people because selfishly, I think that's really am amazing. And like, that's something that I feel can just have its life forever. I don't think it it doesn't really have a shelf life until it becomes irrelevant, like um, 
you know, all the teachings when we grew up, it's like, oh, well, that's not the way it works anymore. This works until it doesn't. Uh, For me personally, that's such a hard question. I find that like success has been redefined as I got older. And I, I don't know, is this the same for you? But like you, when I was younger, I had this vision where I was like, oh my God, when I get this thing, then my life will be great. And then I'm going to get this thing. And then my life's going to be great. And you get that thing. Your life's basically the same. And yep. then you get, the, then you up the ante and you're like, all right, cool. When I get this thing, when I make this amount of money, when I do this. And it's like, if it doesn't, it's not going to click in that way. It's not a thing. There isn't a thing that you get to. There's no finish line. You don't get to run through the tape and be like, great, I'm done. But I also don't want to be. Because then life is kind of boring from then on. If I've got nothing left to learn or do or whatever, it's kind of boring and I don't want to get there. So I find it's really hard to answer that question. I think I want to keep growing and I want to keep learning and I want to keep doing things that surprise even me. And then I'll see wherever that takes me. Okay. Okay. We can put that down. So you said keep learning and then just keep surprising yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. So there's no like bucket list items that you want to put on here? I mean, there are definitely places in the world that I want to go see. And there are things that I want to do. And I would love to work more within charity spaces. And I would love to give back more. I would love to see an advance within my career. I would love, there are all these things, but they're all things that I think will eventually happen. But they're also not things that I'm like, if they don't happen, I don't know what I'll do. If they don't happen, that's also fine. I find that like, as I get older, it's more, I want to be happy. I want to be stable. I want to be calm and relaxed and content and their feelings as opposed to literal goals. I think that's a good way to go about life. (laughs) Just having more good days than bad. That seems to be how I approach most things. Jobs, relationships, everything. You have more good days than bad. You're doing it right. I did write down those other dreams and goals, but okay. anybody who listened will know what it's about. <laughs> I have like two test answers. <laughs> <laughs> so so talk to me a little bit about being happy, being stable, being calm, being content. What does that look mm-hmm. like on a day-to-day for you? Does it look like certain activities? Does it look like having your morning structured a certain way, keeping a certain perspective throughout Ooh. your day? Talk to us about that. I think it looks a lot like trust in myself. And knowing that decisions that I make don't need to be second guessed. They don't need insecurities to fall back on to feel um, like I'm doing something because I find a lot of people do that. Like we have these fears of success, but we also have this fear of failure. And like the way that I move through the world, I want to make sure is moved through intentionally. I want to, I want an, my impact on people to be positive, like, oh, she's kind. Oh, she contributed. She was so helpful. I want those to be sort of the lasting memories. And I think the only way to do that is when you live with positivity, you exude that. And so I'm trying to like refocus my mindset, my energy to be positive focus. It sounds so weird and like hippie when it's said out loud like that, but like, (laughs) I really just want, if I'm, if I'm speaking kindly and trusting myself and I put the majority of my thoughts are positive. I find that what comes out of my mouth is more positive. And then the way I interact with people is more positive. And it's just, it's a ripple effect, right? Mm-hmm. Did that answer the question? That's yeah. kind of how it looks to me. Yeah. So what does, what does trusting yourself mean to you? Mm. I noticed you said you don't second guess your decisions, but if you just never second guessed another decision in your life would you be like I fully trust myself or would there be more to it it's not really about second guessing it's more about overthinking I am such an overthinker that every decision big small doesn't matter I will overthink it and I will think about it from every angle and like what happens if this happens what happens if this happens and none of those are real scenarios rooted in anything but I'm also like such a worrier and a problem solver that I'm solving problems that don't exist. And I want to just have that trust in myself that like, should a problem arise, I know how to solve it, but I don't need to spin my wheels before the problem's real. I think that's the majority of what it is. Okay. How do you think you build trust in yourself? Is it a decision to have it or is it something else? I think it's got to be a little conscious. If you're, if you're 
unsure of the decisions you've made previously, you're going to be unsure about decisions you make moving forward. So just knowing that like everything you did to get yourself here, like everything I did to get myself here was based in a decision that I made and just feeling confident. If you're second guessing all the things in your life, the amount of energy that goes into like catastrophic and overthinking, like how much time in a day am I spending just sitting and worrying about things that aren't real? And I just think it takes time. The more you get to know yourself, the more that you're confident in yourself, the more you just trust yourself. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, I don't know how much these questions are going to apply to you. But oh, let's find out. Yeah, I'm going to ask them anyway. Okay. <laughs> what are the top one to two skills that you feel you need to develop to make your dream life come true? Mm. I do think worrying less is like a number one. I think letting go of tiny things, insignificant things, because they do bog me down. And I think finding better stress management tools is a big one for me. I let myself get stressed and then my body just stays in this like cycle of stress and it finds it really hard to get out of it. And so I think like calming that anxiety, but also just knowing that like I used to have this thing, I moved, so I don't have it anymore, but I used to have this thing on my desk that said, today I didn't cure cancer, which I just found so helpful when I would get really stressed, there would be something at work and I'm like really, really stressed. I have to get this thing out. I have to get this thing out. And I am like sweating and I feel my heart pumping and I'm like not even moving. I'm just typing an email and I am so stressed that it is a physical reaction. I just have to remind myself, I didn't cure cancer today. What I am doing isn't going to cure cancer for anybody else. It's not changing the world. It's sending an email so I can relax. If it comes in 90 seconds later than it's supposed to be, no one died. It's fine. Yeah. yeah I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay. So is that like stress management in your mind? Just remind yeah. yourself getting a little perspective in the moment. I think so. Yeah. Perspective is a really good word. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any other stress management tools that you do or is perspective kind of the number one for you? For stress management? I mean, stepping away. Number one, today I had to do it. I was really busy and I had to like take a break and now it's the end of the day. So I'm like, naturally you just sort of calm down a bit, yeah. but going outside, taking a walk, even if it's 10 minutes, um, sitting, closing my eyes and just taking a few deep breaths. I think we don't notice because so much of us work at a computer, work at look at screens all day and then our stress management or stress relief is going to our phone and scrolling more so we just basically took one screen and replaced it with another it's like copy paste and our brain doesn't really understand that there's a disconnect yeah it's just like oh screen to screen i'm gonna stay in the same super weird state that i've been in and so changing your space going on a walk outside if you've been inside all day or vice versa if you've been outside all day going inside for a bit changing a routine taking a different way to work changing the time that you eat lunch like the little things that we do sort of trick our minds and our bodies into thinking oh there's something different here because if you were stressed monday through thursday from 2 to 5 p.m Friday, your body at two o'clock is getting ready to get stressed because it knows that it's coming so just change it at two o'clock go for a walk yeah. just be like nope we're changing things up today. Hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. What are the highest impact daily actions that are going to tick the needle forward towards your dreams and goals? Mm. I got really interesting advice. I, I'm not going to speak about it in terms of the future because I, I don't have an immediate answer for that. But the best piece of advice that I got when I was younger is I was pursuing, I'm I live in Los Angeles. I was pursuing a dream in entertainment along with literally everyone else in Los Angeles. And um, somebody told me one time that like everybody that moves here, and this is true for everybody everywhere, doesn't necessarily only apply here. Everybody that moves here is on a moving walkway, like one of the ones at the airport or like an amusement park or something. It's a moving walkway. And every day, if you do one thing for your dream, you get to move forward. And eventually somebody will forget to do something that day. And so they'll take a step back and they'll fall a little bit behind the walkway. Eventually it'll go a week or a month and a year and they won't have done anything and they'll get off the walkway. It's not necessarily that you need to spike to the top. It's not an escalator. 
It's just a moving walkway. And the way to get to the end of it is to just do one thing for your career every day and you get to keep that walkway moving. And I loved that. And I used to do that all the time. And sometimes it was like, going to an event, sending an email, staying in contact with somebody, updating my resume, um, working on friends' projects. If it was just one thing every day, and that thing doesn't have to be big. If you have a full-time job and it's just 10 minutes, I need to do something for 10 minutes every single day. If you're a writer, and I got the same advice when I was writing the book, and they were like, just write. You don't have to say, I'm going to write for an hour. I'm going to write 500 words. Just say, today, I will not go to sleep until I write. And if that's one sentence, that's one sentence. And that's fine. If it's a paragraph and you're going to delete it tomorrow, that's fine. Just stay on the walkway. Yeah. Stay on the walkway. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I like the um, small consistency of it because I think it's easy to like go big and then you're going to end up going home too because you can't maintain the going big. And you hold yourself yeah. too high of an expectation, then it creates that anxiety, and then it's just a negative loop. So, well, I don't know if you're anything like me, but like I need a to do list to do things. And so I will write, like, do this, do that, do this. And if I write, get my dreams or dreams come true, like that's not something you can put on the to do yeah. list. Yeah. So I need like small incremental things, and I need to know exactly how long they'll take, and I need to do them just in that way where you get that feeling when you cross something off a to-do list. Yeah. I need that. So that's just how my brain works. So I'm going to write a list of things that I'm going to do this week. And every time I do one, I'm going to cross it off. And it's none of them are get a big job, get a promotion. None of them are that. It might be instead of get a promotion, write down the reasons I deserve a promotion, put that into um, like a deck or something that's palatable, um, schedule a meeting so that I can talk to somebody about it. Like these are the actual steps, not go get a promotion. Yeah. Like, like so I, I've worked with people who have been like, I'm just going to get a job. And I'm like, cool. What exactly are you doing to get a job? And people are like, well, I don't know. I'm just going to get a job. And I'm like, well, did you apply to five things on LinkedIn every single day this week? Like when you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. they let you upload your resume. Did you just, before you got out of bed, instead of scrolling on this Instagram or TikTok, did you maybe just go on LinkedIn and hit apply to five things? It would have taken the same amount of time and it would have been the exact same day, but at least you did something. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Just do the small things and take it forward. Mm -hmm. Like there was a time I went to consistently read and I started mm -hmm. with just opening the book before bed. Like I didn't even read it. I would just open the book. And I think I did that for like 21 days. I was like, okay, yeah. now, now I think I'm going to like read a word. And then every now and then I'd read like three or four words. And then it was two pages. And then I was through two books before I knew it. And I was yeah. like, wow, look at that. Two books I have read that I wouldn't have otherwise read. So yeah. No, I find that really great too. Like when it comes to travel, I always say like, oh, if you just want to go, go. There's never going to be a better time. You're never going to have less responsibility. There's never going to be like a friend that's just suddenly available. If you want to go somewhere, just go. And once you book the ticket, the rest becomes easier. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we kind of neglected this part of the podcast, but take us through some of the more detailed aspects of the book. What are your, like your five to six favorite chapters that you want to disclose? I think it's hard for me to say my favorite chapters, just like it's hard for probably anybody to say their favorite chapters because it's going to be based on where you are in your life, right? Yeah. And it's not just like there's sections like we talked about. There's a section about falling in love that, or a chapter about falling in love. There's a chapter about breaking up or going through a divorce. Those are, of course, not the same ones. But also, you could go through one breakup with one mindset, read that chapter, read it a certain way. And then you could go through a different breakup a year later and read that chapter from a totally different mindset. Yep. The same is true for basically every single chapter in the last three sections. Career and money is going to be what it's going to be. Although there are a couple of other things in there where it's like, know when to leave a job. That section might hit different on a day that's just a little more stressful or, or you've reached a point that's different than when you first read it. But I think for within the first section, the things that I find most important are the easy, actionable, and like half the chapters have checklists at the end, but the easy, actionable ones, getting a high yield savings account so that you're not 
literally losing money with inflation, yeah. at least at the very least, keep up with inflation within like four or five percent instead of point zero zero one percent or whatever, like all those. Criminal. <laughs> yeah, that's you're literally losing money every time you put it in there. It's like, oh, there's a free bank account. I opened a high yield savings account not to get the free money for willpower. The reason I opened it, I picked a bank that it took three to five days to transfer into my account because when like I had Chase checking and I had Chase savings, it was so easy. It was one button and I'd be like, mm, I'm just going to take $500 and I'm going to move it over here so I can go on this trip. And it was like, no, no, now I have to think about it and I have to plan it and I have to do some research and like, then you didn't, you, you're not impulse buying shiny things anymore. Um, And then I just find that like the chapters that people forget or like the the aspects of life that people forget about that tend to be the ones that like shock people the most or or feel like the most um meaningful I think those are great like making friends as an adult is a chapter um recognizing that your stuff is just stuff like when you're gone on earth or at the end of your life you're not gonna be like man I really wish I bought that extra pair of shoes there are just some things that sometimes perspective from somebody else helps you get out of your head a little bit and again you're gonna read it differently like Tuesday, you might read it differently from Friday. And it's, that's how it's meant to be read. It's meant to be read from where you are right now with what you need help with today. And it's fine if you need help with this again, three months from now or six months from now, the amount of lessons that I have had to learn in my life multiple times, (laughs) the things that I have needed help with multiple times. That's why it's a book. It's not a website. You get to just pick it up and keep using it as much as you need. Yeah, no, absolutely. I like that. I like the simplicity of it. I like the kind of, I guess they can't, they're listening. So they can't (laughs) see what, they can't see the action I'm doing, but just how, uh, how flexible it is for every aspect of your life. And so, yeah, and I wrote it for millennial Gen Z, but honestly, the generations above also seem to like really resonate with it because there are things that like, they also missed in their upbringing and there are pieces of like, the world that's just so rapidly changing, it's impossible to know everything. But we're so scared to ask questions. And we just got to this point in our lives where it got like awkward or somebody laughed at us one time when we asked a question. So now we ask Google and Google doesn't always know. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. I gotcha. I'm curious, is there a chapter on knowing when to start a business? No, but maybe the next one. (laughs) Maybe the next one. (laughs) there we go there we go um that was a joke i'm i'm sorry i'm teasing no but when i come back i'll be like you know you were right (laughs) (laughs) cool well take us through so it was um money and finance right yeah and there's relationships Mm -hmm. then mental health mental health, mind yeah and then life and then life yeah and so what are some of the ones in life and how are they different from the other three So the reason life is, it's not really a miscellaneous section. It's just life got, sometimes life weighs us down a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And so we take off in life and we forget about all the things that, the little nuanced things, right? The motivation is a chapter where it's like finding motivation, staying in the like state of flow where you're able to like, keep this motivational mindset and you're able to find like creativity and draw within that um but then yeah like voting charity things that like our lives took over we got so busy at work we got so busy with the house the kids the family that we just forgot about the little nuances of life that like we find joy in and the things that like we forgot how to do like we forgot genuinely just how to live life in an eased way and the mental health section like literally all of this the whole the whole 98 chapters are things that I have experienced and I have lost touch with which is why I'm like the mental health section I think in particular it has the most amount of chapters and that one is the one that tends to be the 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 section that people return to the most often because your mindset literally changes every day. Your finances don't, your relationship might not, but your mental health changes every day. The life section 
also probably very much like career and money. It's not something you reference a lot, but the mind section is the one where it's like, I've had depression. I've had anxiety. I am still an overthinker. There are so many sections in there where I'm like, even if it's two pages, if you just need a break, like we were talking about stress management, if you need a break to just read two pages to be like, okay, this is manageable. The way that I'm feeling right now, the overwhelmed that I'm feeling that I feel like this will never end. This is manageable. And these are some steps that I can take to just calm this moment and like re restart my day. And that's what it's about. That's like what, what it exists. There we go. There we go. Well, what character trait do you mm. most need to develop right now to make your dream life come true? Ooh, character trait. Oh man, that is such a hard question. I really, I don't, okay, like what are some, what are some popular ones? Patience, discipline, focus, consistency, accountability. Those are some that I. Oh, those are really good. Um, I would say discipline is a really big one, but it's one that I pendulum swing throughout where I'm either super disciplined or not disciplined at all. Um, responsibility and accountability I find I'm pretty good at and like. I, f- I don't know. I think the the one that probably resonated the most within that list was patience. I am impatient with the universe. I'm more patient with like myself than I am with like, okay, I've done all of the work. When is this going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> like I've put in all of the work. I've done everything. Cool. It's out of my hands now. When is like this going to happen? So patience just and like recognizing what's not in my control, understanding that like if I've given it everything, that's all I can do. That's probably it. Yeah. The first one there. <laughs> yeah. Patience is so interesting to me. It's as, a, it evolves, right? As we grow up. Yeah. Yeah. It evolves as we grow up. But I also so I understand the concept of patience, how it's described. But then when I take the opposite of patience and I think of impatience, it yeah. just doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense in my head because like patience is like you are willing to kind of like endure and kind of wait for things. But then impatience is like you want it now. Yeah. And I guess it doesn't make sense because when people are like, I need to be more patient, it's like, I need to be more willing to wait. But I think that's the, I think thinking about it like that makes it hard to be more patient. I think about it in terms of, it, it's not necessarily linear. It is in a way where like, as a kid, we need, if we wanted a snack, we needed it now. If we wanted to play that song, we wanted to watch TV, we wanted to do this thing, we needed it now. If it didn't happen right now, we were going to die. Mm -hmm. And that's because our life was so short. Yeah, It's like everything was so short. And as our life gets longer, we grow with impatience because we've had to. So like, while you go through the school system or while you just grow up, you learn that there's more patience that's required of you. But then- you become an adult and you still have no desire to sit in an hour worth of traffic or to wait for somebody to text you back. And I find that like this Amazon prime lifestyle is like wreaking havoc on my patients because I used to be fine waiting in a line. I am fine waiting for something to happen or like sitting on hold on, you know, you call customer service and you're on hold for 90 minutes. I used to be better at that. And now I'm like, no, I need this now. I need to, this answer right now because we've gotten to the point of like, if I'm ordering something, it's getting to my doorstep in two days and it's wiped out all of my patients of, I can skip commercials now. I can, anything that exists on the internet, I need an answer. I just Google it. I got an answer right now. Yep. And so I don't have patients anymore. It's crazy. Yeah, It's just gone. And I, I, I do blame the internet, but I'm partially responsible for that. I'm sure. (laughs) No, I gotcha. And I think it's like, I think there are those habits and I think there is the personal responsibility specifically when you start to redefine patience. Cause I've thought of patience so long as like being willing to like wait or being willing to endure like, yeah, this is going to take five years. Okay. I'm okay. Waiting five years. But I think Mm -hmm. it's like, it's one step deeper of like, 
it's not a I'm okay yeah. waiting five years or I'm not okay waiting five years. But it's like, why are you okay waiting five years? Or why are you not okay waiting five years? And then right. when you ask that question, it's because you're discontent in the present moment. Mm. And I feel or like- Or a that, level of importance that you've placed on what will happen with that thing. Exactly. You either have some expectation mm-hmm. or you're just not, you're like not fully present. Because I feel like yeah. you're fully present- like patience is like it's a non-issue because you're not waiting for anything and like there's nothing in the future you're thinking about it's not like i'm okay waiting for this or i'm not okay waiting for this it's a i'm not focused on this i'm focused on the present and because i'm focused on the present i it looks like i have patience because i'm just focused on the presence for five years straight and then something yeah and i receive it oh that's really interesting i think like I don't know how much you've kept up with like the writer strike and now the actors guild strike. Um, but because both of those are like delaying television for a very long time as they should, the writer strike and the SAG after strike are a hundred percent what they should be doing. Um, I support them a hundred percent. It's just when that all happened, your, my mentality went to, Oh my gosh, there's going to be no shows in the fall. I'm not going to have anything to watch. And I I freaked out a little bit for a minute. And like the realization that the writer's strike is like, what are we, we're like two months into it now? That's two months behind on every single show that everybody likes. And like the shows that were supposed to start in November, they're not not starting in November if the strike ends tomorrow. So then everything's going to get condensed. Everything's going to get pushed. And I was like, I need, and why? Yeah. Because I'm so reliant on this one form of entertainment that the idea of like not having this thing, it's not going to change my life in any way. If a show I like doesn't come back at the date that I thought it would mm-hmm. literally doesn't change my life at all. I could just read a book, go to the beach, watch a different show. Like I'll be fine. But yeah. this I, patience is, it's so hard because I know I've got the capability, but then something that I don't like happens and it goes out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And I get you. I get you. It's like, which is kind of the, I liked your answer about the goals and dreams of like you were seeking that feeling because mm. it's kind of the counterintuitive part of goals and dreams. It's like, if I am, like, if I set a goal or a dream that I really attach to, I'm like, I think Alex Hormozzi said this. He's like, I'm writing a contract with myself to be unhappy or discontent until that thing happens. Yeah. And it's so interesting because that creates that impatience. Because well, also when you get that thing and it doesn't feel the way you thought it would, you you go through a whole grief process. Yeah, and it's it's devastating. And so then you're disappointed in yourself for not feeling the way you thought you would with the thing that you were you spent so long agonizing over. And it's like if you'd just been happy before, the thing wouldn't have mattered. And then you'd get to be happy after, but now you're miserable before and after. Yeah. And it's, it's all, it was always, always that emotion in the moment. I think that's, what's so key of like patience, impatience. It was so confusing to me until I realized that the only reason I'm impatient is because I'm not okay with where I am and what I have right now. And I think it was really thinking about, have you ever read the power of now by Eckhart Tolle? I feel like I have. I feel like I have, but I can't picture the cover right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solid book. It's funny. I can't even picture the cover because I did Audible. But Oh, okay. Still a very solid book. And he was just talking about how everything you've ever experienced, everything you are experiencing, and everything you will experience happens right now. So like, yes. there's there's nothing ever that existed outside of the now is what he calls it, but the present. And so it's just funny to me that like, that whole idea of, oh, when I get this, I'll feel this way. Well, it's like, if you don't feel that way now, chances are when you're in the present, then you won't feel that way. And so even just to add to that, like the, the waiting, we all wait until this perfect moment. I have to wait until I'm hundred percent prepared. I have to wait until I learn this thing. There is no perfect moment and we're never hundred percent prepared. And I always find it interesting when people are like, like, I'm not going to change a job because I don't know how to do that job. 
And I'm like, well, you didn't know how to do this job, but you figured it out. And so once we get into this mindset of like, well, I can't because I'm not ready, we're stuck in that mindset and we're not going to get out of it. And then we're going to work our ass off and we're going to try our hardest to get ready. And then we get the thing and there's still going to be stuff we don't know. It's never going to be the perfect time. We're going to find reasons to talk ourselves out of it. It's almost the opposite of patient. It's like, stop waiting and just do the thing. Because there is no perfect time and there is no perfect level of readiness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if there were one or two people you could meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help Mm. you take that next step towards your dreams and goals, who would they be and how would they help you? Ooh, I don't have a specific person. I have more of like an archetype of a person. That's great. But I think the archetype is the person. I am going to, I have a really hard time like articulating this because it's so visual, but like the person who is sort of let go of expectation. Yeah. And I don't know, like the words of it are so hard, but this person that's like, let go of what's supposed to be, what should, what could, what would. And just like you said, being in the present, but beyond that, beyond like the relaxation and calm that comes from the vision of that person is just this contentness, this belief that like it all works out and that there isn't a right way. There's no right way to do something. So stop stressing about it. Just do the way that feels right, that feels good. And that'll lead you the right way. And it's, it goes back to the overthinking that we were talking about before is like a lot of overthinking comes from fear of doing something wrong. And if there's like a wrong way, how, if I do it wrong, what am I going to do? And worrying about all of that, where if you just let go of this concept, there isn't a right or wrong way. Yeah. I like it. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. And the first question is what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one of the three. Mm, okay. Book and movie, I feel like is very unfair. Um, <laughs> no, you know what? Book I'm going to pick um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And the reason I pick that is because it is the book that I go back to the most. I have read a lot of books and I find that there are so many incredible writers and so many incredible books out there. But the one that I go back to the most has been untamed hmm. there we go yeah untamed by glennon doyle and what is one way you like to take care of yourself mm. stepping away i think stepping away is the number one thing and that's stepping away from anything an argument stepping away from a circumstance that isn't serving me stepping away from friendships that are no longer kind or situations that are no longer kind um places that i don't want to be Or, you know, sometimes it's just literally stepping away from a screen or, you know, a house if you've been in the house and you just need to be somewhere else, like literally stepping away. Um, Yeah, I find that that's the best way to take care of yourself. For sure. What's one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to meet that person who has let go of expectations? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure that I've met people like that and have interacted and been like, oh, I can't wait until one day when I'm like that. But I don't know if there's an action step necessarily, unless I just sort of like removed my entire personality. I think if there was like a stress, a level of stress in my life that naturally sort of loosened you know how like stress feels tight and it feels like a clenched like grip if that naturally sort of loosened I think it'd be easier to find the way out um but life doesn't get less stressful it doesn't and it doesn't get like less you don't get less responsibility so I think finding a way to harness it leads me towards that those people in that that mindset yeah yeah why do you think it's stressful Life? Not just any particular thing. 
Like, what actually makes oh. it stressful? Is it that it is an objectively stressful thing? Or is there something else that makes it stressful? It's a good question. I think life is, the society that we live in is inherently stressful. I think a lot of it has to do with comparison and competition amongst each other. But it also has to do with, we are overloading ourselves with too much in a day. And we are expected to be available constantly. I think before you got to be like, oh, I wasn't home. I couldn't answer the phone. Sorry. Or like, I'm not at the office. I can't do that thing. None of that exists anymore. We are on our phones from the second we wake up to the second we go to sleep. And all this information is coming in. I find a lot of information that comes in is stressful. If you're watching the news, if you're scrolling on TikTok, if whatever you're doing, you are actually taking in a lot of stressful information. And then coupling that with a job and a family and whatever else is going on in your life may also be stressful. It's hard to find a moment that isn't because just so much is expected of us. And there's just so much on earth that like, there's not enough hours in the day. Mm. So do you think it's those expectations that make it stressful? Like if you took away the expectations, would the things still be stressful or is it things plus expectations Mm. that make it stressful? I think it's things plus expectation that makes it stressful. I think even if you took away the expectation that things are still there and they still have to get done and um, there's still information coming at you that you're going to have opinions about or that are going to inform decisions. And so I just think that it's got to be a coupling of both of them. But I do think that things aren't going away. Yeah. So the only thing you can change is the expectation. I got you. So the question I guess I have is, who is expecting it? Like who, who sets the, Mm. like who, where are these expectations coming from? You know? Good question. Well, aren't we kind of all running this invisible race? Like we're watching other people that appear to be doing the same or better, or every person that we interact with, we're wondering how they compare to us. And so I think the expectations are just coming from being a person in modern society and we're watching each other and they're put on ourselves. They aren't necessarily real, but I do think that the expectations exist because of the fact that other people exist. Yeah, I get you. You know, what's interesting about that. When, when you think of like, okay, we're running this invisible race. We exist. Other people exist. That's why the expectations exist. And the expectations are such that I observe and then I interpret and I feel there's expectation. It's all how we interpret it. Yeah, but it's also like so interesting because it's on me. And like if we like step out of it and we extrapolate for a little bit, everybody is observing and interpreting for their own sake. And so they, you are only meaningful to them insofar as uh, it produces meaning from their filter of the world for their life. It's so funny because nobody is watching us as much as we think they are. We're all just in our own brain. We're all thinking our own thoughts and being in our own brain and making these ideas about other people based on our own insecurities. And so it's like, yes, a hundred percent. Yeah. And so like, if we like voiced the expectations that we feel other people have of us to those people, they'd be like, I haven't thought about you since last week. (laughs) <laughs> yep. like, yeah. I literally I have no idea what you did for the past seven days and honestly I just want you to be a little bit happier like I don't want you to feel so stressed <laughs> yeah and you know what's so interesting is how we just we inform the way somebody else said it by the way we interpret it mm-hmm. so if somebody else said something to you they they texted you okay and no other information yeah. we think we think about it for two hours and we're like oh my god they're mad at me and that's just because that's how we read it and that's how we interpreted it yep. and it's all in our own head yeah all they said was okay yep 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 and that's where i found like i think it's been in a couple of self-improvement books i've read like uh the power not the power now the seven habits of highly effective people talks oh about, that's a good one there's like yeah. there's the gap moment between stimulus and response and it's mm-hmm. the ability to choose your response. And that's the small window of interpretation where somebody's speeding, they cut in front of you. And instead of thinking, oh, they knew I was running late to work and they just wanted to piss me off more because I'm already pissed off. You think, yeah. 
maybe their wife is pregnant in the passenger seat and they're about to give birth to their first child. And so I am happy that I was able to let them go. It's that little choice. It doesn't even have to be that high of a thing. I've started doing that too, where it's like somebody cuts you off in traffic or somebody speeds around you. I just have the thought where they're going is more important. Yep. Exactly. Because I'm going to the grocery store. It doesn't have to be this life or death thing. Just where they're going is more important. They need it more. Somebody cuts you off in a line in the grocery store. They need it more. Yeah. They just need it more. And that sentence alone calms me down. Yeah. It's that interpretation. And then it just. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting when it comes to just life of just like, I feel like most of the things you said earlier, nine, like most of the problems that you're solving Mm -hmm you're creating and they never happened it's Correct. just like it's just that run and run and run and it's just like it's man, all in our own head yeah just blows my mind blows my mind but awesome we have a hmm, let's try to run through this last section of the podcast it's all about beliefs okay and so what is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life if any limiting belief mm-hmm. mm, that i can't do something It's not always that I like don't want to. It's just sometimes that I I believe that I can't. And I think that's a limiting belief for a lot of people, if not everybody, that I see something. Oh, go for it. Sorry. I was just going to say that I see something that seems unattainable or unachievable. And instead of figuring out the steps it would take to do it, I just go, oh, I can't do that. Mm. Um, I'll take a really easy example for now, like a recipe. You look at a recipe that is two hours long. 15 different ingredients seems insanely complicated i will look at that and be like i can't do that i just know i just can't do it and i have to sort of reframe that too i don't want to do that or i have to learn how to do that in order to achieve it Mm. yeah is there something that you want to do that you think you can't do or is it mainly just like nothing comes to mind but I think that that's been a limiting thing before for me and when it comes to like jobs for example I've applied to jobs and I've been like I can't do that it's like no I just don't know how to do it right now I absolutely could but I just don't know how to do it right now but I'm able to talk myself out of giving it even a shot because I just say I can't Yeah. yeah I gotcha all right, last question for you. What is your favorite belief about yourself? Mm. I'm adaptable. And I think that's become really useful in recent adulthood. But I'm incredibly adaptable. Something changes in my life. It doesn't change me. I've gotten, I've learned enough about me that I know exactly who I am. And as long as that is true, I am adaptable. A relationship ends. Okay, that's fine. Goodbye. I'll figure it out. A job ends. Okay, that's fine. I will be fine. Um, Just like the pandemic. When the pandemic happened, I didn't freak out. I was just like, oh, okay, well, this is life now. I guess I'll be inside more. And I think I will genuinely say the reason I have become so adaptable later in life is traveling alone. Travel never goes the way it's supposed to yeah and so the more you do it and the more you learn to just not care that a flight is four hours delayed or that that event didn't happen or that it rained the entire time the easier it gets to just adapt and once that translates to the rest of your life oh my god life gets so much easier yeah i love it well natasha that's all we got for you thanks for so thanks so much for coming on the show thank you it was so good to talk to you yes yes is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off no if anybody wants to find the book it's on amazon or barnes and noble it's called shit adults never taught us there we go if you guys are looking to connect more with natasha is there Mm. a way to connect with you yeah instagram at shit adults never taught us there we go. This is going to be very memorable. <laughs> like I, Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if people will forget that. Cool. If you guys loved what Natasha had to say, you loved the idea of those 98 tips and tricks for life, relationships, money, and mind. Did I get those right? You did. Solid. <laughs> um, make sure to check her out. All the links to do so will be down in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for watching. Natasha, thank you for coming on the show. And on that note... We're out.